Let's call the committee to hold meeting to order. Madam Clerk. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Roman. Uh, Bauman. Excuse. Okay, Berg. Here. Bonet. Here. Serta. Graf. Manny. Montemayor. Here. Perez. Here. Peterson. It's excused. He's excused. Rinflesh. Here. Sagali. Here. Stefan. Here. Van Akron. Here. Vanderweel. Here. Warner. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine present. Now I entertain a motion to approve the minutes of September 7th meeting. So moved. <laughs> motion made and second to approve the September 7th meeting uh, minutes. Any corrections? All in favor? Aye. Chair votes aye also. <clears throat> Before we go on with our program here tonight, I just want to say to everybody, like watching television or anything, mm -hmm. at 7 o'clock, don't change your channel because the full council meets at 7, and you know that's when all the fun begins. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight's uh, program, we have the lead abatement program, which the city has received a, a $3 million HUD grant, which the city and the division of public health of the county are partnering in this program. So right now I will turn over the program to Pete Fullerton and he will take it from there. Pete. Thank you, Dan. Um, we hope that uh, we can provide a little fun for you too in the next hour here. Um, thanks for having us. We'd like to talk to you a little bit about the uh, city of Sheboygan received a um, HUD lead hazard control grant from the federal government. Um, I work for the city development of the city of Sheboygan and under the direction of uh, Paul Enders, our uh, Director of City Development, we work uh, with the Public Health Department. And I guess I'd like to introduce a couple of people here tonight and um, then have Jerry Dreykos in from Public Health go through a quick uh, PowerPoint presentation and answer any questions along the way or afterwards. Um, Jerry Dreykos in sitting here. Jerry is a public health nurse for the uh, Sheboygan County and she's also part of our lead team. Uh, her supervisor is Diane Liebenthal over here, and we also work closely with the uh, Public Housing, Housing Authority for the City of Sheboygan, which is Donna Litke, sitting close to the mayor over there. Um, we're, one of the nice things about this program is that we were able to work together with the county, the Housing Authority, and the city to come up with a very good package that we, we, we gave to the federal government and we were lucky enough and we we're very happy to receive this $3 million grant. And uh, I'd like to turn it over to Jerry now to, to pro provide more specifics about the grant. Jerry? Great, thanks Pete. Thanks. Um, why should we care about lead? Well, part of it is, is that what you need to realize and what you probably already know is that lead-based paint is present in homes built before 1980. The reason 1980 is picked is because um, they stopped making lead-based paint in 1978. That was a federal rule. However, as most people know, they, people tend to hang on to their um, paint cans for a lot longer than that. So that's why they say homes built before 1980 80 could definitely have less lead-based paint in them. And children under the age of six can easily be poisoned by the dust and the chips um, from lead paint. One of the reasons I chose this picture um, that you can see up there is because of the fact that a lot of people think that children get lead poisoned because they actually sit down and there's a paint chip there and they eat the paint chips. And we're finding out from studies that that's really not the case um, as much as what you think. Most of the time what happens is that children get lead poisoned because of lead dust. It's either from um, remodeling improperly that causes the dust or just even simply opening and closing um, older of, of windows of older homes and that creates dust. It falls into that little trough called a window well and the window is open and the kids look out the window, they put their hands there and they tend to put their hands in their mouths more than um, older children and adults do and they slowly get poisoned. Um, the reason that we should be concerned is because poisoned children have problems with learning, growth and development that can affect their whole life. Next. One of the reasons I chose this next one, if you can take a look, is a bell graph and, and the Big, biggest thing I want you to understand about this bell graph is the fact that 
most people's general, um, the average IQ level is about 100 points. What they're telling us with lead is the child who gets lead poison, even at a very, very low level, or even any lead in their bodies at all, causes lower IQ levels. So, you know, you're thinking, well, why, why would this affect me? I'm not, I don't have any children under the age of six. I don't live in a pre-1978 home. Well, I tell people it affects us all. And the reason it does is because if you get a certain percentage of kids, and for us it was about 66 kids in 2003 and 80 children in 2002 of the kids that were tested that had lead poisoning. And of those children, every one of those kids has a lower IQ level. Say they lowered their IQ level by five points. The upper graph is the normal graph. The lower graph is just showing that if you lower the general population five points IQ level, a 57% increase in um, developmentally delayed kids who just really have learning problems more than anything else. We're talking about attention deficit and things like that. And who does that affect? Well, that affects all of us because that means who's paying for their schooling and for special education that they need in school because they're learning disabled. So it really behooves us to try to work together and try to um, eliminate lead poisoning. And the goal of the federal government is that we eliminate lead poisoning by 2010. Now, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to make that goal of 2010, but we're working real hard at it, and this $3 million is certainly helping. Where is lead poisoning in Sheboygan County? Well, really, where it is, it's in the city, and that's why they awarded the um, funding to the city. Our target area is the city of Sheboygan. However, if there is a lead poisoned child in the county, then we also will do um, a county residence as well. What this map tells us is the darker areas are the pre-1950s homes, and the red dots are where the lead poisons, poisonings have occurred. And what I really just want to let you know is that, and you, you figured it out, is that it really is probably from North Avenue up to um, like Wilson Avenue, those, that gamut, that's what they would call the inner city of Sheboygan. And really, um, they say about 65% of the homes in the city of Sheboygan are pre-1950s. And years ago, the best homes had the best paint, and the best paint had the highest lead in it. This, is, this problem isn't going to go away unless we renovate these homes. Again, like Pete said, we got $3 million, and HUD wants us to renovate 225 homes over the next three, three and a half years. We do have an extra six months to complete and clear them, but we do have to enroll 225 homes and be in process within three years. And we're about nine months into the grant. We started in January. Um, my role is to educate families the landlords and the homeowners and the community, such as um, you guys. I've been to um, the Realtors Association. We've um, talked to many different groups, lead um, the Lead Task Force. We educated them exactly what's going on with the community, so we work well together. We've gone to the Hmong Association. We've just been um, quite a few places in the community. And then as far as training goes, we not only get the $3 million, it's not just for education and it's not just to renovate the homes, but we also have to train workers. And our goal is to train, or we said that we would train at least 100 workers over these three years. Well, we've already trained 75 workers and we just conducted another training last week. And we're supposed to train them to be lead safe abatement workers, lead supervisors, and lead risk assessors. One of the reasons HUD wants us to train people is because we have to hire people that are certified and know what they're doing with lead because if they go into these homes and they try to renovate these homes and it's not and they're not doing it safely then they're just going to create more of a problem and we're going to have more poisoning than what we did before so the EPA and HUD has set, uh, set aside um, certified classes and certain um, certain groups like the Milwaukee Lead Information Center are actually certified to conduct these classes and um, We've um, tried to recruit some of the contractors in the area and just landlords, just about anybody who's interested to be lead safe abatement workers and supervisors. There are many landlords who like to work on their own properties. And even if they don't want to work for our grant, we just we really want them to be able to work safely with the lead and not poison kids any further. Then the lead risk assessors, we already have um, two risk assessment companies that we're working with with the city of Sheboygan. One is Lakeshore Lead Consulting and Bob Day is the head of that. And then we're also working with Cardinal Environmental and they have four risk assessors, three to four risk assessors that we're working with that conduct our lead um, risk assessments. Next. Why Sheboygan? You're probably thinking, why did the federal government pick little Sheboygan considering there was only about 30 or 35 that were awarded in the whole um, country last year? 
Well, one of the reasons is because we've had a really strong community-led task force, and we've had this for about 10 years. And who sits on the community-led task force? There's partners for community development, the schools, the Sheboygan Clinic, both hospitals, the Sheboygan Housing Authority, city development, ourselves. And we just kind of proved to the federal government, which is what they want to see, is that we're, we work well together. A long time ago, um, when I first met Pete and we went on um, visits together of lead poisoned children, no one told us that city and county government weren't supposed to work well together. And so we've always worked well together. Then Donna came in on the mix and she was just as supportive as Pete and I were, so it really was a good mix and I think they saw that. Our lead poisoning rate, again, it's no shock that we were only second to the city of Milwaukee when we applied for this grant and we used 2001 statistics. So we have gone down considerably, but it's still not where we need it to be. And we really, um, we had about 8.9% of the kids that we tested were lead poisoned, which amounts to now about 66 of them. Again, the same thing, lower IQs and higher, you know, schooling for them. Housing stock, I had talked about that, 65%. And also, um, when we applied for the grant, 41% of the homes in the county are pre-1950s as well. One of the things that um, the state has really commended us on is our great public health lead poisoning prevention program. The state wrote us a glowing recommendation and that really helped. We've been in existence for a long time. Um, more, boy, I've been in it for 11 years and it's been longer than that, that it's been in existence. And also, um, we work well with our WIC program. My office is right next door to WIC and we do screen all of our WIC children, which has proven that um, they, they do have higher prevalence of lead poisoning and the state really knows that and notices that we work well together. The history of success with city development. Um, Pete and I, again, like I said, we worked together a number of years ago on a HUD project. Um, the state of Wisconsin actually was awarded some HUD money and we worked well together doing renovating probably about five or 10 homes. That was just a small portion of what we get today, of course, but we proved to them that we were able to handle that money and we were able to renovate those homes. And of course, we have a strong Section 8 housing program, which is out of the federal government as well. So I think um, the under the leadership of Donna Litke, that has really um, commended us as well that we were able to get this grant. Some of the guidelines that I just want to kind of give for the grant, just in case you have some of your constituents asking you about it. One of the things that I guess I was a little surprised about is this grant is just not for the poorest of the poor. It's for low to moderate income people. So take a look. You can have a family of four and make $50,000 and still qualify for this grant. And you're thinking, well, why would that be? Well, you may be able to afford to buy your own home, but after you've sunk all your money into the down payment and trying to make the house payments, it, take, it takes some money to replace windows. Window replacement can be expensive. And so a lot of times um, these families can't afford to renovate their properties the way they should be renovated. And um, if they apply for this grant, they may qualify. The house of the grant, first of all, we have applications for tenants and landlords, and they have to fill out an application. Obviously, the landlords fill their portion out if, they're, if it's a um, owner investor property. And if it's an owner property, of course, they fill out the entire application. Qualifications um, for the program. First of all, HUD wants us to recognize that children under the age of six are the most, um, that are gonna have the highest risk for lead poisoning. So one of our qualifications for this grant is that you need to have children under the age of six or if you have a pregnant woman working with a public health program because we have a strong prenatal care coordination program and we work with pregnant women and obviously they're gonna have their babies and live in those homes. So. That's one of the reasons why um, we have that as a qualify. That can be a qualification as well. Or if it's a daycare, an in-home daycare, um, or if it's a vacant unit, unit and you agree to um, list your unit with um, Donna Lickey for the Section 8 housing. The other thing is, is the income guidelines. Of course, you can't make 100 grand a year and, and still qualify underneath under this grant. So you have to have you have to be income qualified as well. Once we um, go over the application and verify that they do qualify, then we send one of our risk assessors out into the, in, into the unit to actually do a full risk assessment. And they actually go through the home and um, with the assistance of something called an XRF machine, they're able to detect wherever the lead is. And then they also do a visual assessment because we do not treat the lead where, it's, where the lead paint is intact. Lead paint that's intact on these, there's probably lead paint in these walls 
but it's not chipping or peeling, so it's not causing any problems. But as soon as you start renovating, that's when it's going to cause problems. So they actually look to see where the paint is in poor condition, and that's where they write their, their recommendations as to what needs to be done with this house in order for it to become lead safe. Once they write the recommendations, then Pete comes into play, and Pete looks at, actually, um, looks at their recommendations and writes up an order specification, the spe what he would like to have done with the house, and then his secretary sends out these for bids to all the certified lead contractors that we have in the area at this time. And then he allows like two weeks for them to bring their bids back, and then he takes the lowest bid. Um, once he does that, then there's, there's a bunch of red tape in there with the city, I know that. And um, he tells me that they're just about ready, and then my job is to actually relocate the family. And what I need to do, actually, is that those, the people that, whose houses are being worked on, they cannot be in the home while the, home, while the work is being done. And that's a federal guideline that they're telling us they cannot be in their home. So we have actually um, leased out two furnished apartments at the old um, Foxcroft apartments, which are now the Oak Creek apartments on Union Avenue. And we put them up into that um, apartment for the week. It usually takes about a week for the work to get done. And the work process is the contractor usually comes in on a Monday and um, starts the work. He usually takes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday, possibly Thursday to do the interior work. He gives me a call and then I have to actually go out and do some dust wipe sampling and send that overnight to the lab in West Dallas. And then they call us the next day to let us know if the dust wipe samples have come under HUD specifications. They have, to meet a certain, they have to meet certain guidelines for window wells, sills, and floors. And the reason we do this is because, again, the contractors just can't remove a window and leave their mess sit. They can't just pull up carpeting and leave their mess sit. They actually have to clean up the mess, and they have to do it in a safe manner. And the way we're going to be able to prove that is by doing dust sampling. And then when the dust samples come back below the HUD standards, then we actually call the family and tell them that it's safe to go back into their home. We do give them an incentive as well. HUD has had encouraged us to give them an incentive so that they do stay out of their home. They're not allowed in that home. Pete and I aren't allowed in that home. Only the contractor and his workers are allowed in that home when the work is being done. And the incentive that we have come up with is that we give them a $50 um, grocery store gift certificate. And that seems to be a pretty good incentive. Most of these families are just thrilled to get that $50 and just by staying in a furnished apartment, they're, they're doing OK. Um, and then the other thing that we're looking to do is to um, put some of these homes into a lead registry. The state has also developed a lead registry um, where they can be awarded a one year or three year up to a five year, 10 year lead safe certificate. And our goal is to give them a three year lead safe certificate for the homes that have lead poisoned children so that there's, the standards on those are a little bit more strict and a little bit more costly. Um, um, things have to go into that home. HUD is telling us that we can only put $10,000 into a home. Well, that doesn't amount to a lot, especially if it's just a single family home. And what we're actually ending up doing is pretty much replacing the windows. But I can tell you of all the years that I've been in, in public health and worked with lead poisoned children, I would say at least 90% of the kids that have gotten poisoned, it's been because of the windows. Because those, if you've looked in older homes, they're wood windows and they're painted. And you open and close the windows and the window jams inside the, with, through the weather, through the wet, through the cold, through the snow, everything that tends to chip and peel and dust falls into the window well. And you can't even clean it that well. You try to clean it, but sometimes it's not even any better than beforehand. Whereas nowadays, if you've looked in the, in the newer homes, it's all vinyl and you can clean it real, real nicely. Well, you can't in the older homes, it's all wood. The lead actually soaks into the sill. The bid process, again, um, Pete is the one who goes through that, the cost limit per project, the contract agreement. Did you want to say something sure. here, Pete? Go ahead. Um, we also, as Jerry mentioned before, we put up an average of $10,000 per unit. So if you have an upper and lower flat, which is a lot of units in the city of Sheboygan, we can put up to $20,000 of lead hazard control money into that unit. And that money is used strictly for lead hazard reduction activities. As Jerry mentioned, many times it's window replacements. We'll take old wood windows and have them replaced with vinyl windows. And, um, and there's some miscellaneous painting and, and that sort of thing, depending upon each house. If 
the cost of that runs over ten thousand dollars we do have the luxury of our community development block grant funds we have rental rehabilitation loans and owner occupied housing loans where we can put some of that money into the process as well the lead hazard control monies one of the incentives that we had for people to apply for this program is if at this point if we put ten thousand dollars into a home if that if it's an owner occupied unit and that owner occupant continues to own and live in that property for five years that loan is forgiven after a five year period what we do is if there's more than ten thousand dollars worth of work that needs to be done we will supplement our regular community development block grant program which is a loan and that loan is dependent upon the income of the owner occupant some loans are deferred payment payable when the property is sold there are other loans that are installments where they make payments each month that just gives you an idea of, of the amount of monies that are being put in into the property um, just to give you a quick quick number and I'll let Jerry continue is that in the first nine months of this year we did some calculations today we have closed by closed we have signed the paperwork for 25 units 11 of those units are owner occupants and 14 are rental properties we are going to invest two hundred sixty four thousand dollars in the community with lead hazard control money that has also we've been able to um, match that money or put an additional one hundred sixty eight thousand dollars of regular community development block block grant monies into these homes for not only lead hazard work but also maintenance item code violation problems within units so we will do things like replace roofs um, upgrade electrical systems furnaces that sort of thing so in the first nine months of this year we've invested over four hundred thousand dollars into the uh, uh, city of Sheboygan and we're projecting out hopefully by the end of this year just in our lead hazard control program we hope to invest over six hundred thousand dollars into the community go ahead Jerry sorry oh no that was good next <clears throat> And this is a little bit about where we are at with not, you know, Pete mentioned numbers, but just as of August 10th, it, it, there's no um, secret in the city of Sheboygan or in Sheboygan that if something is free, people are going to go for it. And we've really not had any trouble with a getting applications. In fact, we probably are in the 160s now of how many people have applied. Um, 11 units were not eligible. Either they didn't have children under the age of six, they didn't have grandkids coming over, or they just were over income and they just didn't qualify. And one unit, actually, there was no lead found in it. So, um, like Pete had said earlier, I just want to clarify a little bit what you had said, Pete, with the, with the landlord. If it's a landlord, the tenants don't have to live there five, for five years, but the landlord has to own that unit for five years. And one of the incentives for that is because we don't want them we don't want to pump all this money in and then they sell it to make a profit is what that's why we're that's why we say they have to have it for five years go ahead one of the reasons why we we talked about that um, forgivable loan after five years is a lot of the work that's done for lead hazard control is um, paint stabilization and doing a lot of things that are really maintenance type items that after five years there's probably a good chance that some of the painting would have to be redone in that five-year period we're trying to make these units lead safe for primarily kids under six at that point in time. We also know that these, the homeowners and landlords will have to continue to monitor their, their units and make necessary repairs each year. Um, just a little update on the numbers. Right now we have, as of today's date, 162 applicants in our office, um, which is over 100, is, a, is 175 children under six years old that live in these units. There are many other children that are over six, that are under 18, over six, under 18, that live in these units. We don't have those numbers for you tonight, but there are many families and many children that are going to be um, hopefully positively affected by this, by this program. And our goals, um, our goal in 2004 was the minimum that HUD required, which was 11, because they felt that um, they, they set their goal low for HUD simply because you really have to get your program off the ground and I can't stress enough how well run the city development is with this because there are many, um, there was a county that was awarded in, in Wisconsin a grant a year ago and they came to us and asked us how to run the program. They wanted to look at our policies and procedures. They still weren't even off the ground and so of course there was a red flag there for their county but we've not gotten nothing but um, 
good remarks from the federal people that were running our program well. Biggest thing is, is that um, we're not concerned about meeting our goal in 2004. It's 2005 and 2006, and it's, we've got our work cut out for it. Uh, so I'm not going to um, say that we don't, but I think we can make the goal if um, we work smart. What, one of the things that we're doing is, you know, Jerry mentioned red tape before. I guess, I guess what we call it is we're trying to make sure that every applicant is eligible and that we know if at the end of the day, if there's monitoring, which will occur from the federal government, that we are, the city of Sheboygan is the recipient of the grant. We are the responsible party for the dollars that are going out of the office. So we do make sure that applicants meet income requirements and that, that all the other work that's being done is, is handled in, in a proper manner. Where do our referrals come from? Well, obviously, if you can take a look, they're from every aspect that you can possibly imagine. Um, we get them from our prenatal care pro program. We got some from the media when the Sheboygan Press first announced that we got this grant. The realtors have done a um, pretty good job of trying to refer people. Of course, it's a great selling point if someone wants to purchase a home and it's pre-1950s and or even pre-1978 and they're thinking, boy, it's kind of in bad shape. They can talk to them about this grant and that's a nice selling point for them as well. The Hmong Association has really helped us out with the Hmong people trying to help them fill out applications and talking about this grant. Um, religious organization St. Clement's Church has been wonderful about announcing things for the Hispanic people. Um, Head Start has sent things out in their flyers and definitely that's a great population to get it to and we've worked well with their health educator over the years. Um, right away in January I was able to talk to the apartment association with Donna Lutke and Diane Liebenthal to get the word out to the, um, to the landlords about this program and there's, a, um, there's quite a few landlords which is what we want. And word of mouth, of course, in Sheboygan probably works the best. One neighbor said this was a great program. She had her house renovated. Now we've got the neighbor down the block doing it as well. Um, Department of City Development and the Sheboygan Housing Authority have you know, been our great, greatest cheerleaders for this program, obviously, and the Hispanic Latino Task Group. And weatherization programs is um, Partners for Community Development. They have also very much highly recommended um, this program and tried to get people to apply. Biggest thing for you guys to know is that if we do the 225 homes like we said we were going to do, we will get funded some more. So 225 homes is just the tip of the iceberg, and when it comes down to it, it's about the kids, and that's why we're working really hard because we, who doesn't want the kids to be as smart as they can be, and we shouldn't have lead poisoning. It is 100% preventable, and there's no reason if we don't work on these homes that we can't get it down to zero by 2010 or maybe just a little later. Any questions? Yes. It's always there, just so you know. I mean, if you put latex paint, and like I said, I'm sure these walls have latex paint, but underneath there's probably lead paint, and you're fine with it because you're not remodeling and you're not, be you're not generating the dust. But what we're finding is that people, yeah, they, over, they paint their windows. I've had a landlord who had a child with lead poisoning. He, he repainted the window. That's what he did with it, the window well. I came back and did a dust sample. It was higher. It was higher than when he first started. So it, it's not the answer. And we're finding the studies are showing that it's just more economical versus, you know, based on energy and all those other things and lead that we just replace the window. So not only are we, um, as far as lead hazard control work, we're making houses lead safe, but I think we're also keeping the housing stock where it should be and, and hopefully in some cases increasing the values of the properties in the city. Hope that answers your question. Yes, after, uh, let's say six, seven, seven years after someone goes through the lead abatement program and they sell their home, is there a follow-up to the new owners uh, in any way? Let's say, you know, a young family moves in, goes through the program, moves out seven years later, and another young family comes in, and you're nearing the period where you may have to look at that house again. The, um, the risk assessment that occurs before we actually do work on the property, it's, a, it's typically a pretty thick document, and that does run with the property. So okay. that is given to the homeowner with uh, instructions that typically when a property is sold, there is a lead disclosure form as far in, in real estate, and that document would go with that. <coughs> so that would be, hopefully the new owner would be knowledgeable in where the lead was and, 
and things that should be monitored and that sort of thing. So, yes. And that's part of my role too, is when, when we close the property, part of my job is to make sure not only the tenants, because even though the tenants may move out in, in a month, they might move into a property that's in worse shape. I, had a, I, I need to make sure that they understand where lead poisoning can come from and where deteriorating pain is and what it looks like and what happens. Then I also educate every landlord. They, they get a booklet on how to deal with lead paste paint base pen safely. I send them a letter telling them even though at this point in time their home is lead safe, they need to do yearly inspections and even, you know, just be diligent about looking at the paint to be sure it's in good condition. Because the only way to make a home totally lead safe is, would be to level the entire home and start over. And we say, we're not going to do that. This is a beautiful home. There's nothing wrong with this home. We just need to be educated about how to deal with lead base paint safely. Anybody else? If not, I'd like to thank Pete, Sheboygan County Department of Health, and the Housing Authority for being here tonight and showing us this program. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And just once again, go ahead. Once again, it just shows the sharing of services between the city and the county. Okay, if there's nothing else, I entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion was made and seconded to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary, carried. We are adjourned. I'm going to turn off all the mics. Yeah.